Yes, there we did. I feel we should have pens and paper. <laughs> Ask the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly Trevor's, um, I think, and, and the cleverness that he realised that it was very, very timely because there's that line that uh, Cynthia uh, Hayden comes out, which is like, I'm perfectly aware that all class barriers are being swept away and everyone is as good as everybody else and class distinctions laughed at. Well, that's, that is as relevant today as it was in 1951. And I think that it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's given it a special relevance. And other things that are happening, we could read across, like the Festival of Britain, you know, we, we remember the Olympic Games happening uh, again, with London, Britain showing it off, off to its best. And there are a lot of things that resonate then and now. But I think above all is this uh, still this obsession with Downton. Um, Downton. <laughs> <laughs> People say, you know, the Eto Etonians in, in the cabinet. So it's very much still there. We went to David Frost's memorial the other day, Trevor was there, and, and um, there was a whole page in the order of service saying, you know, the Dean of Westminster will greet the Duke of Duchess of Cornwall will greet. And um, Trevor said, see, very the Duke is changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so what is it about kind of uh, Noel Coward's work more broadly as well that you think is kind of still so timeless almost today? I think he's incredibly perceptive of human behavior and, um, and human emotion and human interaction and uh, I mean really to an extraordinary level. I, I mean he can see just as well into the mind of a woman as he can a man. Would you agree? Absolutely. And so um, there's so much for one to get hold of and that level you can you can transmit so much to an audience and, and that's you know engagement. It, it, what, what happens between an <coughs> audience and, a, and performance is essentially engagement of these things that you recognize and you want to listen to and you feel you're part of it. And I think that's what he's a master at. I think there's also an, in, an incredible, insightful um, understanding of the American culture as well, this British-American rub that we have, you know, and, and the American sensibility that uh, we have our own uh, aristocracy, which is Hollywood. And that, that 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 is the equivalent, and yet it isn't, you know. And the, the understanding for a, a writer to be able to understand, you know, two cultures in that way is in, incredibly perceptive and as let, well. And let them implode. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And and the details of what that means to understand and get inside of those those characters and those minds is brilliant. He's like an, an observer. Of, I mean, he understood in the way that sort of Julia Fellows does with, with Downton, but Noel Coward absolutely understood. Both upstairs and downstairs, the class scenes. Mm. And I mean, that extraordinary thing when he talks about um, the class distinction between Cresswell, who's uh, the son of a police constable in Seven Oaks, and uh, who's it, Stephen Bristow, who is the son of a tobacconist in Folkestone. Oh, uh, exactly. And he says that, you know, one happens to be a golf instructor and the other happens to be a butler, and the social gap between the two. I mean, that's a very, sort of very specific uh, dissection of the class system. But, uh, but the coward thing, line after line, how many funny lines, just line after line after, you know, I gave birth to you in the middle of Ascot week. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, you know, the washing painting of the car, line after line after yeah. line, which comes, you know, as fresh as, as the day it was born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned working with uh, Trevor Nancy, who is directing this. Um, was that kind of a major draw as well? It was for me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, I, th I, you know, who better to really guide you through something as complex as this? Really, I mean, for I, I can say that for me, um, I know for all of us, we, we just the process is is wonderful because it's not just a note uh, of you know do that faster or louder or funnier. <laughs> you know, there's a, a huge history behind each comment that he makes, and that's incredibly helpful. He, he was he's he's passionate about this play. Yeah. This was not this was not just a, a work a day, yet another production for him. Not that I'm suggesting that anything else is, but he very particularly, he really had a thing about doing this play and he had such an insight into it and he had such a clear vision of what he wanted to do with it and he wanted to make it real. He said, I want this to be real and funny. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the Alan Brody, who looks after the coward stage, 
um, said, and he saw it last summer, he said, this is only ever, I've only ever seen this as very bland play. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you um, if you play it just for laughs, on, on the canon of Coward, it is not one of the funniest plays. And people so, get so used to very funny plays that you might think by comparison they don't see this. But then if you invest it, it actually, in many respects, has a lot more to offer than some of the other plays because it doesn't just depend on the laughs. It, there, there, there's, you know, you're pulled in so many emotional directions. Yes. And that's what Trevor absolutely helps us to. Um, yes. and, and that's, you know, that's to have anything that's driven by passion is the most you can ask for mm -hmm. because it means it's going to have a, it, it's going to have a very clear vision. Yes. I, I completely reiterate the Trevor point uh, because this is the first one that I've done and, and uh, uh, Patricia <laughs> and Caroline have both said to me, they said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get any better uh, than this. I mean, I'm starting at the top and working my way down. <laughs> uh, but how Trevor works is a sort of insight. The first day one, um, this is when we, because we did the production in, in Bath before, and day one he sat us down, uh, and for an hour and a half we spoke, he, just took, he gave us just a master class, just a lecture about Noel Coward, uh, about how when he was in his 20s he had four plays on in the West End. He took us right through, the, the, right from the word, the word go, 1899, so he was born, so he was as old as the century. And he himself wasn't born to the sound of gravel crunching up a long driveway. You know, he, he wasn't born into privilege. But after an hour and a half, we had a very strong idea of Coward. Then he said, right, I'm going to go and have coffee, and I will come back in 20 minutes, and I'll talk to you about 1951. And he gave us an hour and a half on everything happening in 1951, mm -hmm. the Korean War. Um, <coughs> The spying scandal, hence, you know, Creston talks about this piece of un espionage on my part. Point, 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 point. And it, it was, and you just, it both, after both speeches, the cast just applauded and we saw, and we knew day one, right, this is the world we're in. And what a brilliant idea to have those uh, newsreel things because, mm -hmm. not just because he wanted to set it specifically, but how do you get across what a big film star Miranda Frail is? Arriving, and there she is in these news. Oh, right, so the really big film star is coming to Marshall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking, okay, I'm looking out the hand. Has anyone got any other questions? Oh, yeah, the one at the front here. Has the production evolved? Have you made many changes before it came to the West End? No, what, from last summer, you mean? Yes. No, um, actually, the only change was <laughs> sitting here. Um, I tell you, day one. She walked into yeah. the house and I we mean, all went, wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then we got to know her a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it was, absolutely. So was she, was, she was Miranda Frail from day one. As, as some of you may have seen it in Bath when Kat Kingsley did this. She's doing Dirty Rotten Scoundrel. Um, but Miranda, uh, Miranda, well, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we walked in and we, we'd been pinching ourselves and we just couldn't believe, I'm not being a lovey here, we just couldn't believe she was just brilliant. It was, it was a privilege for me because, uh, you know, it's always very intimidating to walk into a company of everyone who's done it before and you're the only one who hasn't. And I, I have to say of, of all the productions that I have ever done, this is the most welcoming and professional and confident in who they are as people as well as actors, which is refreshing. You know, it's a mature company of intelligent actors and, and that's really rare to find on and off stage. But we didn't. We didn't make many changes. You, you asked that. No. I mean, what, but what you, you know, this this in a way was a very rare privilege. I I've spent many years having done plays, um, and there's always been a sort of thing in the back of my mind that when you drop a script, when you finished a play, it will sometimes new, sometimes later. Because the actor's nightmare, you know, is to, is, is to have a dream in which you're asked to do, you're asked to go on stage again uh, to do a part that you haven't done for months and you can't remember it. I mean, it really is a nightmare, and all of us have it at some point. And I always thought, I wonder how long the words stay in your head. And this is the first time that I've ever had it tested to this degree. So we stopped doing it last July, I think it was, yeah. And we picked it up eight months later. And we sat around <coughs> the room on day one. <coughs> Extraordinary how much we did remember. Mm. It was just lying latently there. And apart from some details, and of course, you know, there were sections of it you could almost just lift up from the script and <coughs> just remember. So what we were able to do, that something happens, is a process of osmosis, where you've absorbed the play. So when you come back to it, 
you are actually that much sharper and keen, and you can see things very clearly that you couldn't see in the first place. So what I would say is that this is, is a richer version of what we did last year, simply because we didn't have the time last year. In essence, we've changed very, very little, but it's just, it's just sharpened up and Trevor's sharpened up. So there's a bit uh, in the second act where Nigel kicks a cushion over across the stage, and you couldn't help but notice the fear in his eyes because he felt like he kicked it too far. <laughs> well, it, it has quite often fallen off. <laughs> <laughs> his aim is poor. <laughs> Get him into ma manage Manchester United. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's part of the fun, I'm sure, when things do go slightly wrong, and, and everybody does make a slip up, get a slip up occasionally. Um, what was one of the way Stephen? I think I mean, how good is Stephen Pacey, by the way? Oh, I mean, just, <laughs> so I mean, the way what he found in that character as well. I mean, you know, I, we, I mean, upstairs, about upstairs there's, 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 a, Stephen, doing there's a Stephen there. Pacey uh, Appreciation Society up there. <laughs> you know, so. How are you? Hangover. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one night here, he says, when uh, Lady Marshall comes and says, What on earth are you doing? He says, Shaking hands. And one night he goes, Holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> and he just came up and said, I just said, Holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite was Ben Ben, who played, again, brilliantly played Don Lucas. And, uh, you know, she says, You know, I, I cut you off like a withered limb. And he's supposed to say you know, to, to Lady Marshall's afterwards, You know, she, she said I was a withered limb. What did he say one night? I didn't say No, what did he say? Oh, he, he said, said, he said, I have a withered oh, limb. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's right. He said, I have a withered yeah. limb. <laughs> you went tonight. You laughed tonight. Possibly, uh, I, I, I didn't, and I think I, I think it was a slightly unconscious decision, but a, a, a deliberate unconscious <coughs> decision, if that makes any sense. I didn't want to watch Downton or Remains of the Day because I knew that if I did, I would base it on that. So that was sort of an unconscious, deliberate decision. Um, there are a couple of influences. I wanted to do an upstairs and downstairs thing, although I, I spoke to Janet March, who lives at, at Goodwood, and she has a, a and, and, and actually Patricia and Caroline both have butlers. But it begins to be your butler. Um, um, so uh, yeah, er, uh, but there was there was that, that, I was told that Janet March said that you know the butler was the poshest person in the entire house. I said, but they let, let the boys slip below stairs. I said, no, below stairs they were even posher. She said. <laughs> But I did, we did his, her butler, one of her, 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 her previous butler came in and spoke to, to, to ask me about the class and about how you present the tray. <coughs> and that was quite uh, interesting. There were some insights from that. But no, not a specific character. I just, I just thought I would, it would be an imitation. And the voice is partly a policeman who arrests me once for, uh, well, in charge for, for, for speeding in barns. And the, other, <laughs> and the other part is slightly a homage to John Fortune's um, thing. He said every now and again, whenever I say, you know, um, uh, may I make a suggestion, my lady? Uh, there's a little bit of John Fortune who I love but miss very deeply. Uh, I think we've got time for one or two more. Does anyone got any final questions? Yeah, one at the back end. So I have a question um, for all of you, but it's a bit on me. Um, apologies if this upsets you, but um, the, the Telegraph, I can't remember the Daily Telegraph or Sunday Telegraph, I forget. Um, said, and I quote, Rory Bremner cannot act. And <laughs> he said that you actually sounded like John Major. <laughs> <laughs> I can only conclude, and I'm gambling here that the most of the audience will be with me on this, that the Sunday Telegraph or Daily Telegraph cricket have had too much to drink. <laughs> That's an easy way not to take any notice of them. 
Because I think um, even if they say good, bad, or indifferent, you can't help but be affected by it. And it's as, it's as damaging to, to be aware of something that you do well as it is to, to be aware of something you do badly. Because, you know, you have to work from inside something and you do what you, you think is right and you have to have this sort of, you know, you have to believe in fairies, really. Um, and as soon as somebody actually blows the whistle on you, what, what do you do? You know, you lose your confidence. Um, and you also, by being aware of something, you've lost the very thing that made it work. So it's better not to read it. That's something I've learned as well. I've people, I've heard people say, oh, actors don't read, they really don't. And to, to a superstitious extent as well, uh, both for good and bad reasons. Um, and that, that's something that I've learned as well. And, because, and, and then you also, there's, you know, there's some criticism which is constructive and some which is personal. Um, but if it's constructive, it can help you if it's personal, it, it, gets, it, 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 it can get into your head, so that's not good. You can probably read them much later. I mean, I, I always said, well, I'll read them much later, and then actually, by the time you've done some, you're not interested in it anyway. You know? <laughs> um, it's, it's yesterday's fish and chip paper. But um, I, I think, obviously, what we do get is, is the gist. You, you get a sense of whether it's worth it. It's what, what, what Patricia was saying, though, is incredibly important to the morale of a company. Um, and the, the, the greatest parallel that I could draw of my personal experience is I worked with a brilliant director um, on Broadway named Jerry Zachs, and he, get, he sat us all down the very first day and he said, I'm the director, so if all of you observe each other's performance and make a comment on each other's performance, you're doing my job. Now, you can give someone a compliment Oh, you, I love the way you do that line. Well, you're actually doing them a disservice by doing that as well, because the next time they go and do that line, they're going to think, oh, I do that line very well. You know, it's the same as saying something negative. And in a way, it's a similar situation with critics, is that you, you hook into something that they've said, or so, and, and you take it to heart. And, and really, that's not our job. Our job is to believe in the piece and deliver it in the best way that we can, and, and, and not look to them for for that validation or, or otherwise. The people that matter are yeah. sitting there in front of you. Yeah. But there, there was, there was, was a comment on the first night, which, which, which I've always thought is totally unfair. I, I, you know, the job that I've been in, I would hate to have been um, assessed on my first day. But also it's a very different atmosphere. I mean, I yeah, you, see, know, you see, you see, this is the fascinating thing. There's, <laughs> there's absolutely no question. <laughs> that the first night, whatever you do, and in this case, we had quite a delayed first night for various reasons. Um, so we were, you know, we were much more confident than you normally are. Even so, it really gets to you. Critics never see the show that everybody else sees. It is a fact. Um, I mean, I, I, I had I'd re I'd read the, for example, Michael Billington's review, which, I, which was interesting because I think he was as, as, I think he was as, as generous to the production as he could have been, but it's not a play that he liked. But the reason I mention it is because it divides opinion as to whether it's a play that's snobbish and reactionary or timely and, and, and tender. Uh, in effect. And as, as a cast, we're all completely on the side. We've all gone native with Noel Coward. That, that it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a snobbish and reactionary play, but, but he doesn't, he's not siding totally with the butler. He's saying that for... Moxie and for Crestfall, they've actually they've got it pretty cushy, and at the end, you know, this is the, the, the life that they've they've got. And, uh, so, but that's not necessarily coward saying two fingers to Attlee and that government. I think we, we come down on the side that this is coward observing. It's a, a light comedy, uh, and he he knows his subject, and he is. It's at the end of the day, it's about about values, and you read about the mage, and the, it was very important they, that hierarchy that they had. People knowing their place, the servants knew their place, but very important, it was important that the aristocracy knew their place as well, and that's what made it function. So, um, while it was a, it was a, a, a generous and perceptive as he, as he always is, it was, a, it was a different opinion about the play. Uh, and as you, as people have said, you know, you can only perform it as well as you possibly can. Great. I mean, I think that is all we've got time for. I'm afraid we have to head out. But thank you very much uh, for joining us. That's really interesting. Q and A. Uh, so yeah, just if you join me in thanking Rory Brick.